everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. All right, today's podcast is titled "Why BJP Will Dominate Till 2047." Now there's a background to this uh, title. So I came across this uh, article on the 15th of August that was written um, in the Times of India by Nalin. Uh, this was India at 100. BJ Why will BJP be dominant? Most likely. Uh, and I was fascinated by this article, so I reached out to Nalin and told him, Nalin, aake baate karo, and here Nalin is. Nalin, welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Kushal. Always a delight to be talking to you and 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 on this platform because um, uh, I think uh, uh, the last time when we talked, the amount of data you use and the kind of freewheeling conversation we had. I think it's rare to get that all around a book and it's always a pleasure speaking to you. So thanks very much. All right, buddy. So let's start with this. Uh, how did you go about making this case? Because there were two articles, a paid version tha, usme specifically 2047 year likha hua tha, and uh, this was the open version on 15th of August in Times of India. So uh, I'll hand it over to you. You make your case and tell me whenever uh, if you want to put a screen up or something, we can put up a graphic screen. You can do it from here end too. Great, uh, thanks, Kushal. I think the um, okay the, the 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 Times of India article which you referred to was part of their special issue um, on seventy five years of independence. And what they had done was that they had um, asked a um, question on uh, to four different people. One, where will India be at hundred years of independence in twenty forty seven? In the economy, uh, for women, for uh, for education and on politics and specifically where will BJP be in 2047. Um, so they asked me to write on the BJP question. Uh, and my answer to that will be that uh, was that uh, which which you referred to in the piece was that in 2047, the BJP will remain dominant politically. Um, and um, let me just um, uh, put one caveat there. Uh, when I say uh, politically dominant, um, uh, I you know, uh, I, I, what I'm meaning here is as the primary poll of the polity in the larger sense. Um, uh, I am not saying that BJP will never lose an election between now and 2047. That's a very That would be a very simplistic interpretation of that. That's not what I'm saying. It will win and lose elections. What I'm saying is that there is now a BJP system uh, and that uh, has come to dominate the Indian polity uh, and, the, and that is not going to go away after Modi. Uh, it's not going to collapse after Modi. BJP will remain the single most important party in Indian politics for the next 50 years. And let me just take a step back and explain what I'm saying. So um, when you look at Indian politics, uh, Kushal, uh, so um, there was a Congress system that ran this country, right? Uh, after independence, the Congress was the dominant party for a very long time. And where I'm coming from is that a um, few months after Jawaharlal Nehru died um, in 1964, uh, there was a young political scientist called Rajni Kothari who wrote a very seminal piece. Um, uh, he basically, uh, he called this piece the Congress system. Um, and he basically said that India's political system is characterized by, it's a democracy, but it's characterized by one party dominance. Um, so basically what he said was there's one party and there are part of, which is the party of consensus, which is the Congress. And every, everybody else fights against the Congress. It's Congress versus all the rest. But the Congress is the big burger, burger, burger capet, essentially. Right? It's a very um, fiercely competitive polity. It is not that it is not a dictatorship. It is not a uh, it is not a kind of a, a one party state. Uh, it's fiercely competitive. But political parties play different roles. The Congress was dominant and everybody was, was around it. Um, the because the rest of the polity was fragmented and because it was divided, it further legitimized the nature of the consensus of the rule of the Congress. This Congress system, which basically characterized the first maybe 40 years, 30, 40 years of our uh, post-independence history, essentially started collapsing around 50 years of our independence, around 1996. Um, 1996 um, is the first year in which the Congress falls below 30% of vote share in national elections. Uh, the BJP, um, uh, if we can, uh, if you uh, you have those graphics, uh, Kushal, if yeah, you I do. bring up, we've got I some do. I do. Uh, graphics of comparing the Congress and the BJP 
their vote shares so you know 98 abhi right now we are having such a large uh, debate ar bharat jodo yatra bhi chal rahi hai rahul gandhi ki agle saal mm-hmm. agle mahine congress is going to elect its next uh, um, if you can go to the tab on vote share uh, kushal that be great uh, the first tab the yeah. the pre, the tab on the left so um, uh, the, the congress is going to put up its next president the sonia uh-huh. gandhi who is currently acting president has been the single largest has been the longest serving president in congress history when she became president uh, for the first time in 98 2 years before that the congress for the first time fell below the 30% mark it has never regained that mark ever since right that's fascinating um, what sonia gandhi did was that she essentially uh, held the line over the first uh, over the uh, two decades of her uh, do, uh, her control of the congress and she managed decline um the congress fell to somewhere around 24 25 uh, kushal if we can uh, look like can i share my screen if that's okay sure sure um, please so share the be, um, yeah yeah just uh, just choose the share screen option and you this. can do it yeah um so yep so um how do i share screen in oh yeah i got it here yeah once it comes up i'll put it on the screen so uh, um what she basically did was that she like i was saying what sonia gandhi essentially did was she managed decline can you see my screen kushal yes okay so here here is my screen and look mm-hmm. at these vote shares mm mm-hmm. the congress if you see here 1996 mm-hmm. uh let me try and reduce the uh there you go can uh, is that a bit clearer uh, on the screen yeah yeah it's clear if you see the vote here so 1996 yeah, yeah. is where the congress for the first time falls b- below the 30% mark Two years later, Sonia Gandhi becomes president, and look, they've never got above thirty percent again. Um, there was a slight uptick from twenty-five to twenty-eight percent in two thousand nine, but that was it. So Sonia Gandhi essentially preside, held the line and postponed that decline of the Congress. And I think she should get credit for that. That they, two times they came to power, um, but that system is now exploding, imploding, and the BJP has replaced the Congress as. the dominant party in this country and there is now a bjp system um look at the vote share for the first time bjp crossed 30% in 2014 and it went much higher around um, so almost 40% in 2019 but this is not just about um um the national share if you look at regionally the bjp went from 12 point if you look at the northeast it went from 12.8% in 2009 to 33.7% uh, in 2019 If you look at East India, it went from 9.3 percent in 2014 and 2009, sorry, to 39.7 percent in 2019. Um, in West India, it went from 27.6 percent to 39.8 percent, uh, and in South India, where the BJP really has never been a, a, a party except for except for Karnataka, it went from 11.9 percent to 17.9 17.9 percent. What I'm trying to say is that the rise of this bjp system has is not just national it is spread across geographically across the different regions of india and not just the 11 hindi speaking states of the hindi heartland which are the fulcrum of the bjp political advances so far you are getting uh, you are getting seeing a major expansion of the bjp in terms of the vote shares are a proxy for deeper roots of the system below you know we we get we, we look at 300 seats more the one in 2019 300 plus and we think what a majority look at the vote share even in that uh, election uh, the bjp uh, got uh, even at the heights of height of its triumph it was less than uh, 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 it, uh, it was less, just about 40% of the vote about 60% plus of india didn't vote for the bjp but even then in terms of the g- depth it it grew in different regions of this country including in areas where it was not uh, uh, been powerful it shows has become the party against which elections are fought it uh, w- whether it's important there or not now um um there are two key points i want to make here and and then we can sure. you know really open it up for discussion um these vote shares show that this shift from the congress system to the bjp system is a robust shift it's not a one off black swan event um it's deeper 
uh, and it's likely to uh, uh, um, so, and so th that's one indicator of this the second is uh, it has been um, powered by new bjp politics around building new social coalitions of new caste groups and a larger consensus around hindutva right um, essentially i think in the old days when the bjp was stuck at the 16 17 18% mark which was basically the vajpayee era of the 90s the bjp becomes uh, the single largest party in india only in the mid 90s under vajpayee um, uh, when the ndf is first created from that mid early 90s mid 90s period to the mid to uh, early 2000s in that period a big problem for the bjp was that ideologically hindutva was a persona non grata for many other political parties right they had to pinch their nose to align with the bjp so hindutva was a blocker for bjp expansion what has happened now i think structurally what has happened in india is it at the same time as when bjp is growing deep roots in our polity and the numbers show that region by region state by state um hindutva is no more our ideology of hindutva and right wing hindu nationalism is no more a disqualifier for the bjp it is now in fact a core part of the bjp's brand differentiation uh, it speeds its electoral wheels uh, when it gets a social coalition rights in elections where the bjp gets a social coalition right hindutva is really helps the bjp the core vote of of the bjp is remain constant that 16 17 percent of the hindutva cadre of the hindutva ideologically motivated voters who will vote for bjp because of hindu nationalism come what may that has remained constant what it's added is a much larger pool of people who are who will vote for bjp when they when the when uh, at the right time or who don't have who will not not vote against the bjp because of this and for other things they will vote for the bjp but they will not hold themselves back in voting for bjp that floating vote because just because of the party of hindutva i think that is a major difference the second uh, difference i think is the bjp has adopted a policy of mergers and acquisitions in new catchment areas these include states like bengal uh, northeast in particular um, uh, 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 in several other states uh, uh, so that is making it it uh, uh, accumulate for, you know more um, stakeholders in power as it expands because once people see look this is the party which jo dominant ho gayi hai so anybody is an ambitious politician they see a future in joining the bjp so i think that merger and acquisition strategy is really helping the bjp in some states so what i i made a prediction in the toi piece which was that because that piece asked me to look at put a crystal ball and look at from now to 2047 so in this period over the next 25 years of our journey as an as an independent nation i think we should expect to see the bjp's first chief ministers uh, in states as diverse as telangana odisha west bengal maybe even in tamil nadu in the long run and tamil nadu is a tall claim because tamil nadu the bjp is basically insignificant as a party in tamil nadu it's got two regional parties dmk and admk there but in the long run i think tamil nadu also you're seeing some shift that's a much longer thing but in the shorter horizon and i'm saying over the next 25 years you you know you will see bjp chief ministers in telangana odisha west bengal in newer states where, where you've never seen a bjp government before um i think the third and final plank is that the bjp was deeply dependent on the rss till 2014 um the bjp and rss have a very symbiotic relationship ideologically they are part of the same parivar um um and i think that remains however uh, in terms of electoral mobilization um the bjp has grown five fold over the last um 8 years it is almost now double the size of the chinese communist party by 2019 the bjp had 174 million uh, registered members which is about 29 times the size of the rss um even if you uh, think even if you assume for the sake of argument that about one third of these 174 million registered members are transient members ie people who have joined bjp only because it's in power and they will defect as soon as bjp loses power in some state or the other even then it is one and a half times the size of the chinese communist party and it even then it is multiple times the size of rss so what i'm saying is that powered by new women voters powered by a new kind of social engineering Uh, by advances in rural india which is where the bjp's real constituency now is in the north indian uh, rural heartland the bjp has undertaken the largest cadre building exercise 
at a national level since the 1950s Congress. There's nothing uh, on this scale comparable politically since the 1950s Congress. It has built some 500 plus party offices in approximately two thirds of India's districts. So that's the kind of the skeleton, if you like, uh, for the front end of the world. Um, this is, um, it has deepened its roots in India's political firm, firmament. Um, it's used technology. Uh, it's used, uh, done a major managerial restructuring and used technology to augment that managerial restructuring. Um, and I think what's similar between the old Congress system and of the 50s and 60s and today's BJP system is that that Congress system was also characterized by the lack of a coherent nationally united opposition. That is what we are seeing today as well. Um, the real opposition to the BJP is at the state level, at the regional level. Um, so I think in a post Modi era, um, even before that, you could see a, a national opposition, united opposition put together after all, like you saw in 1967. Um, you could see AAP replacing the Congress in many states as, a, uh, as a, taking over the Congress role. But in the absence of a strong opposition national party, which the Congress ha was, but is now declining further. Um, and without a fulcrum for other regional parties, without, say, a unifying factor for every opposition party, uh, it makes the BJP's job easier in the short run. I'll stop there. Okay, so two, three questions here. When when we talk about these trend lines till 2047, so uh, if you don't mind me, and I don't know if you've looked at it like that, so just for clarification. So have you actually looked at it from 2022 to 2047 and broken it down in like five-year or 10-year terms, as in they ascend more and then fall down? That is question number one. And question number two is that uh, is one of the biggest reasons for BJP success that yes, Hindutva has become now a guiding factor till the extent that uh, even when you look at the social discourse in India, I'm not saying this, you are saying I, I'm making my point as per, you know, my analysis of the Indian political landscape. Look, 20 years ago, a lot of things were not said in Indian politics on Indian television. They were not even discussed. That's how narrow the Overton window was. And that's how you know, on the left, the Overton window in India was. Now, on the other hand, a lot of things that were, um, you know, blasphemous to say on TV or were holy cows, whichever your leaning is, are said on TV now. Very clearly mm. said on TV. The people say things which were not heard. Mm. So it clearly is that the societal thing has changed. So is the BJP strategy that... Look, there is a caste consciousness in India, whether people like it or not. And how, what BJP has successfully done is that it has convinced people about the message of Hindutva and it has not forgotten the caste consciousness. And it has added people based on that caste factor too then, Nalit? Yeah. So uh, I would say to this, Kushal, uh, uh, let me take the first question first. Uh, you're right on the second count. Um, and I'll take that later. Um I think uh, when I was doing this kind of, see, uh, I think it's always dangerous to do crystal ball grazing because of even a week uh, is a long time in politics. As I understand, um, that. right? Um, um, you know, you know, counterfactual history in many ways is like a parlor game, as the historian E.H. Carr once mm -hmm. said. Um, what we were doing was looking at long-term trends of the polity, not looking at predicting election by election and so on, because that is a, uh, you know, uh, the fact the variables always keep changing. That's not a robust uh, statistical game at all. Uh, uh, the long-term trend, uh, the basis of this idea of the BJP becoming the primary pole of our polity, as opposed to the winner of every election, and that's an important distinction, is this. See, there are four kinds of states states in India. I basically did a state-level analysis, um, and if you, uh, because that's the core of our political system. So there are two, four kinds of states. The, the first kind of state is, um, and let me show you a graphic uh, as well, and see if um, uh, if this works. Um, yeah, well, whenever your graphic comes up on the screen, I'll put it up. Don't worry. I, I have not stopped the share screen, so I can see your screen. Okay, right perfect. So, um, uh, so there are four kinds of uh, uh, states in um, in India, uh, Kushal. Um, the first is, I think, states where, the, which are a two-party polity, which is BJP versus Congress. Now, these are mm -hmm. states where they've historically been locked in combat, direct electoral face-offs so Gujarat, Himachal, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand, uh, Delhi, Karnataka in recent years, even Manipur and Tamil uh, and and uh, um, Tripura recently, 
roughly speaking, power alternates between these two states, right? Now, post-2014, in most of these states, that pattern of oscillation has got disrupted in national elections. Uh, it's not BJP not only swept these states post-2014-19 in national elections, its vote share went up dramatically. There's figures on your screen show you the first category of those states. And look at those numbers, uh, the expansion of the BJP vote share. The second, so the takeaway, I think, is that with the Congress drastically weakened, unless the Congress revives, uh, it, it reduces its convening capacity for any any robust alliance in that state. Um, and while the Congress, so UP is, clear, uh, is a good example. Um, if or West Bengal is a good example. In those two states, for example, if the, um, uh, the, the Congress refused to align with SP or BSP, um, uh, and a, a, fra a fractured polity always helps the BJP, right? Uh, now, that's one kind of state. Um, in Gujarat, which is which is an election happening now this year, um, the anti-BJP vote, and BJP has not lost power in Gujarat since 1995, is with the Congress. The Congress, even in the best of times, that 35% vote share in Gujarat, even at the height of Modi's popularity. Um, but this year, you have AAP and Congress fighting for, the, for that space. Congress, AAP, will, AAP has took over the Congress vote in Punjab. It, it, how much it will take over in Gujarat, we will wait and see. So what I'm saying is, the, as when the when the regional party, which is trying to become the new dominant opposition party, and the Congress in a two party uh, uh, two party system, wherever it is declining, as long as they are not collaborating and they are always fighting for survival right now, it helps the BJP. So long term trend, it, it's it's BJP's favor. Second is BJP versus regional party. These are states where BJP replaced the Congress um, or others as the primary opposition party, and a regional party is in power. Uh, so these are states like Andhra, Telangana, Bengal, Odisha. In these states, look at the number. In Odisha, BJP went from just one seat to eight seats between 14 to 19, 21% to 38% vote share, uh, even though BJD swept the state polls. Uh, Bengal has seen the same pattern, uh, where uh, in Bengal, B BJP was completely trounced by Trinamool in the Vidhan Sabha election. But in Lok Sabha election, it's become the number two party. Even in Vidhan Sabha, it's the number two clear party. The left and Congress have been decimated. So whenever the wheel of politics turns in Bengal, the person who will benefit from it is BJP, not left or Congress. Because, if, because in these states, the BJP has become the anti-establishment party. In a state like Telangana, for example, uh, mm -hmm. you don't have to support the BJP to get to BJP's side. Because... They, the TRS has been in power for two terms now. Anybody who's upset with the TRS in Telangana or anybody who's upset with Mamta Banerjee in West Bengal after two terms of power, they have uh, the only way they can they can vote against, vote against them is to go to BJP. So that is why the BJP has become a strong number two player. So at some point or the other, the wheel of power will turn. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so and also, I think many of these regional parties are essentially looking to safeguard their home turf, right? Uh, from an aggressive BJP. So you may, um, so they all may want a weaker BJP at the national level uh, because that suits them. But in the app, as long as BJP remains strong at the center, you might get into tactical arrangements. Okay, you leave, you know, let's get, fight on this turf here, but Bahar ka, you know, dek lenge types. The second is where there is a regional party versus the third is a regional party versus a regional party. So uh, uh, Tamil Nadu is an example of that. Where BJP is not a factor, where it's ADMK versus um, DMK, or Kerala is another example of that. In these states, um, uh, in those states, you are seeing small green shoots of BJP emergence in certain pockets. I'll give you an example in Kerala, um, um, BJP won over 31% vote share in Thiruvananthapuram, which is Shashi Tharoor's constituency, uh, and over 25% in uh, Patanam Titta uh, and Thrissur. These are little green shoots. Over next 10 years, 15 years, they will develop further. In Tamil Nadu, BJP started making some advances in North Tamil Nadu with caste alliances. Very small, but I'm, that's why I'm calling them little green shoots. Um, and then you come to states which are a multi multipolar polity. Those are states like UP, Assam, Northeast, Jharkhand, even Maharashtra somewhat fits this category. In these states, the BJP ascendance has forced many regional parties on the back foot fighting to keep their once captive vote banks. So overall, I think... Um, um, all grand coalitions in the past, Kushal, have either needed a big party as their fulcrum 
or like the Congress or a charismatic leader who punches above his or her weight. So Harkishan Singh, Singh Sujit, for example, from the left in the days of uh, the U, 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 uh, the uh, the uh, the um, the third front government. Uh, why in the absence of that, um, I think the biggest challenge um, for the the, the I, and, and I think creating that is the biggest challenge for all opposition forces in the run-up to 2019. So 2029. So that's uh, uh, that's one um, um, part of the answer. The second part, I think you were saying about what what we were saying about what was once unsayable is now kosher to speak about. I think you are right, uh, and I'm not sure that's a very good thing. Uh, um, I think uh, there's a large debate to be had on uh, Hindu nationalism. Uh, which is a legitimate debate to be had, which is a debate that has not been had for a very long time. And that's why the BJP is pushing that and it helps the BJP. Um, however, there are certain things um, which are also challenges. Uh, Hindu nationalism is one thing and you can debate the pros and cons of that. Uh, for, for example, Hindu nationalism has many streams, um, uh, uh, um, both which go from both left to center to right. Just this week, you've had the planting of the statue of Nitaji Subhash Chandra Bose in, in what was once the Rajpath in, at the India Gate under the canopy of what uh, of what, which once held King George V. Uh, it's taken 75 years of independence to put that uh, put that statue. Nitaji Subhash Chandra Bose is a figure. He's always been a nationalist figure and not just a, a, a Hindu nationalist figure at all. In fact, he comes from the left of Congress ideology. Uh, uh, he was more left than Nehru uh, in economic policy and so on. Um, so Hindu mm -hmm. nationalism has many streams. And I think the Prime Minister talked about this very particularly about Gulami Ka Pratik and all of that. So that there are many streams within Hindu nationalism or within nationalism per se. Um, and I think there is one stream of that which also comes gets around to debates around the minorities, uh, uh, debates around Muslims, and all of that. And there are many things that uh, that that become challenges as you go forward. It's one thing to speak about the primacy of Hinduism. It's one thing to speak about Hinduism as a cultural force, and of course about the definitions of Hinduism and so on, and about Hindu symbolism. It's another thing to get into hate speech. So I think those are also challenges for the BJP as it becomes bigger, bigger and larger. Yep, I understand. Now I want to talk about this AAP phenomenon. Now, how much of uh, uh, of Congress's mess ups is the reason that AAP is gaining, and how much of it is its own hard work? Also, if the Congress has a strong regional leader in a state, do you see AAP coming up in that state? Um. So, uh, I think the AAPs. Um, growth is is being caused a great deal because of the vacuum created for opposition politics by the complete uh, withdrawal or, or the failure of the congress to be an effective opposition force and that's because of the basically because of the leadership crisis in the congress um look at the states where AAP has grown delhi it basically took over the congress vote punjab it replaced the congress it's trying to do the same thing now in himachal and in and in gujarat it failed to do that in uttarakhand um i think AAP is doing a couple of things uh, which are different from the congress first the the AAP as a product differentiator uh, is completely identifying itself with hindu nationalism in a way that the congress never does the Congress is very confused about it. The Congress takes up, essentially, the Congress's brand positioning today is that we are against Modi and we are against BJP. What else Congress stands for is very difficult to define because Congress speaks in many voices. That's number one, right? So, for example, I'll give you an example of this. In this Bharat Jodo Yatra, Jairam Ramesh issued a statement on the day the Bharat Jodo Yatra was starting, starting that we talked about opposition unity for 15 years, 20 years. Where did that lead us? This is now about strengthening the Congress. This is not about strengthening the allies because if we ally with others, it will it, it it leads to us weakening. Rahul Gandhi, on the other hand, who's his boss, said no, no. We are now talking about alliance part alliance politics. So the Congress, I think, is confused on because short for short term uh, fighting BJP it needs alliances, but it knows that long term is it's going to it's going to affect it. So it's stuck between two stools. Similarly, on Hindutva. 
Congress says one thing on the on, publicly, but on the ground it does something else. For example, Congress has completely supported the Ram Temple movement, uh, 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 the Ayodhya judgment, starting from Priyanka Gandhi downwards. Uh, the Congress voted in favor of Article 370. Uh, the Congress um, uh, in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh uh, spoke um, on the ground in man manifesto spoke uh, it spoke very specifically about the cow and about about, about ramayan pilgrimage sites and so on and about the ramayan in particular um so um you know if you are going to be a b team or if you are going to be a the, going to uh, uh, rahul gandhi becomes a janeu dhari uh, um uh, brahmin every time before an election so i think people get you i mean people will vote for the original hindutva party and why will they vote for you so aap in that sense has been smart um aap has been very careful not to take on the bjp on issues around hindu nationalism at all in fact it's aligned itself with that you saw that in the delhi riots you saw that in the um uh, in the uh, aap's promises around uh, 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 around the tirth yatra to the ram temple for older citizens so that's one thing it's very clear about that brand differentiation and the aap has tried to present a model of governance the delhi model now we can have debates about the delhi model whether it's real or how real or not but in the same way as modi had a gujarat model uh, which he could present to the country nationally whatever the debates around that aap is trying to present a delhi model saying that look humne health power free kiya we uh, we improved schools we improved health whether they did or not is a different question but they have a model that they have they have a narrative around it uh, and they are doing that and the communication is very effective uh, on social and and other platforms in a way that congresses is not and that is why every in states where it is a bjp versus congress uh, polity um, most people are saying the only way to beat bjp is to go with these guys so so the anti bjp voter or the old erstwhile congress voter and there is a large constituency of that is basically moving to the person who is most likely to beat the bjp and that is up in these states yeah but don't you think like let's say in a state now the congress is trying its best to destroy every single strong regional leader in its capacity that is a separate issue the congress is really trying hard to destroy itself but hmm. where it does have a strong leader i think the aap might might run into certain problems right because there see especially at the state level elections we've clearly seen patterns even in even with the bjp that in states where bjp does well nationally in the you know in the central elections they don't do that well in the state election when there is a good state alternative from the other political outfit even even if it is congress so i mean if i'm extrapolating that maybe that's what where i'm coming from that even there aap is also going to face that problem right i totally agree with you kushal you are absolutely spot on um so this is happening in states where there is a complete vacuum of congress leadership not in states where congress uh, remains strong so you look at for example karnataka karnataka they have not been able to make inroads karnataka uh, uh, congress remains it is divided uh, between the dk shivakumar faction and siddaramaiah but it remains a robust strong party you going to see a very strong contest in karnataka next year between bjp and congress it's a it's a it's a real fight on the on the cards you look at chatisgarh where there is bhupe uh, uh, um, you know where there is a congress government in punjab congress uh, aap could make inroads basically because congress destroyed itself uh, in, uh, for a year the opposite you had amandar singh as chief minister and you had navjot singh sidhu implanted by the by the gandhi siblings who basically for the for the for the for a one full year before the election there was no opposition except that the congress was his own opposition navjot singh sidhu was taking pot shots on the front page of newspapers every day on his own government so people just got sick and tired of it and decided to give aap a chance so this is basically a aap's resurgence apart from the fact that it is doing this strategically tactically aap made the mistake in 2014 of trying to, it its success got got heady to its head and it tried to expand nationally too fast as a political startup so kejriwal went and fought with modi in banaras in that constituency they learned the lesson from that and they decided to hunker down and work on cadre mobilization state by state so now they are doing it systematically so you've seen growths in two three states it'll take 10 years if they get it right and i think whether they get punjab right or wrong as a government is very important because so far they've controlled a bonsai state which is delhi delhi is not a full state government uh, punjab is um so what how Pan aap governs punjab uh, is is very important for for the aap's projection and and that that's an open question and second 
um, the the opportunity for aap to get its foot into the door is in states where congress leadership is 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 declining or absent in gujarat i'll give you an example in gujarat uh, last time why is aap gaining traction in gujarat because in in the last election in 2017 just imagine the congress gave the bjp a real run for its money in 2017 it was a very close election rahul gandhi had just become the president of the of the congress party it was a close election it won because the prime minister essentially went and campaigned it was the pm who turned, who turned the tables on that election till the end was a, i covered that election and till the last minute it was touch and go congress could have won 2017 in gujarat but between 2017 to now look what has happened in in gujarat the congress is completely um unrecognizable from the party that fought 2017 in gujarat um almost all the leading lights that won that fought the fronted the congress campaign have now moved to the bjp in the last 5 years and then at the district level at the level of third tier and fourth tier leaders in almost every district is 70 to 80% of the congress le- leadership in the districts has defected to the bjp so in that vacuum where will the voter who is not happy with the bjp go uh and and voters were not very happy even then uh, uh but the bjp won because it was a better organized party so this time aap is trying to step into that vacuum and it goes directly to the point you were making got it okay i'm going to start uh, taking viewers questions too so how does nalin think the 2026 delimitation will affect indian politics i was actually going to ask this question but a live viewer asked it so i'm i just might as well ask that that's question. a very important question and i think that uh, the 2026 delimitation uh, has got both a lot of good possibilities for bjp but also challenges um see the uh, for um for those uh, just for background Uh, the importance about delimitation has always been that our that while uh, we had a delimitation about uh, a decade ago is uh, a reorganization of lok sabha seats about a decade ago as well but that was in the size of in the size of constituencies so certain constituencies expanded certain became smaller but the total number of constituencies didn't change and the number of seats allocated to each state did not change that remained constant only the boundaries of constituencies changed so the number of seats that every state has has been constant since the mid 70s um what the 2026 delimitation is going to be about is that it's going to change um the seats that every state state has in consonance with its population that's been frozen for the last four decades and the problem with that argument is and why it was frozen is because in the 70s when the delimitation was supposed to happen uh, the last round of this the argument was that fundamentally if it's all based on population then basically north india has controlled its population far less than south india has south india is far better south of the vindhyas south indian states have been far better on development indicators they've been far better on population control and so on and population was a real problem from the 70s onwards in india when india was trying to control its population and the north indian states which couldn't do it now you will say that you will reward those states to give them more seats um and the south indian states because they've done better on these things they will actually end up getting a smaller share of the pie as a result of it and that is politically very sensitive and that is why and it's and you can legitimately argue is it fair uh, the, it, the you can make an argument both sides you can say well you know that's the nature of the population of this country so therefore if north indian states have more population give them more seats uh, give them a larger pie already the north indian states um, uh, you know are, are form the majority of your parliament so that is why that can was pushed further down the road now i think beyond a point you can't keep the keep pushing the can further down the road if the delimitation relation happens in the way that it is supposed to happen then of course the north indian states the 11 hindi speaking states of the hindi heartland will get more seats than they have today a state like up already has 80 lok sabha seats is the maximum then you have madhya pradesh you have other states their their share of the pi- the number of seats in parliament will expand the the seats north of the vindhyas will expand further and the, the not there'll be regionally the balance will change and that i think benefits the bjp basically because the bjp's primary source of power is in north india in south east and northeast it is expanding through mergers and acquisitions so so but the challenge there and the challenge there is because this is a very open question this will take a long time to resolve and there's a lot to happen before 
a final decision on this is taken and when this is rolled out. Um, so the challenge will be that a lot of states will say, look, you have been, what happens to the political balance of, of equal share for everybody and so on. Um, so I think this is something that you, this is the kind of debate you have even in developmental spending. So that is why you have the concept of special states, for example. Um, the, because for development funding from the center, each state gets specific amounts based on the population. But there are certain states like the hill states, like tribal states, like Kashmir and certain northeastern states that get a much higher share than, than their population, basically because of the special status. Um, saying that, you know, just population is not enough to per capita uh, share is not enough. The same argument is deb debate is going to play out in the delimitation case as well. Now, this is uh, another thing that came to my mind. Um, this delimitation issue then, how does one deal with it in that sense that, you know, you have the classic American problem also. And in America, the popular vote and the electoral college exists. For people who don't understand it, ja ke Google kar lena, electoral college yeah. kya hota hai or popular vote yeah. kya hota hai. And I, I think that is one of the biggest reasons they kept the system like that, right? So that the smaller states do not end up being dominated by the will of the larger states, right? That that was the case, right? Just say, agar koi choti si state hogi, jiski population kam hogi, magar unko unhone equal representation in some states. Do you think India will eventually have to tack, tackle this problem? to make sure that the southern states you have, have to tackle this problem you have to tackle this problem because uh, you are already seeing this happening in in kashmir for example uh, uh, if you see uh, the delimitation that's happening in kashmir now because in kashmir the reorganization didn't happen earlier already you are seeing a reorganization between the jammu between the jammu region and the uh, srinagar valley where which a lot of um, uh, what the original parties from the valley which is the PDP, which is the National Conference, they are protest protesting about that. But it's a fair, uh, in terms of the population uh, between Ladakh, Leh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, it's a fair it's a fair redistribution of seats based on the pe based on the people in the erstwhile state of what Jammu and Kashmir was. Now, of course, it's all UT. So before the state election next year, you will have the delimitation exercise completed, which will change the demographic of the representation because it represents it, it it'll be a more accurate reflection of the demographic of that state you're seeing two things happening in kashmir one is the uh, reorganization of, of seats uh, ahead of uh, um, uh, statehood being restored at some possible point before a possible election and second is you are seeing a um uh, this bar on outs uh, on non-state residents coming in and being allowed to vote in the way that they can in any other state you know, people move from one state to the other in India, they can get themselves registered and they can vote. You couldn't do that in Kashmir. That is happening there. Now, that is not a not a problem in most of the states in India. But the same argument is playing out in Kashmir now will play out in the national delimitation as well at a very ideational basic level. And you are right. I mean, eventually, oh. eventually, it is not an argument you can hold beyond a point of time. You can only push that argument to some time. You can only say, okay, politically it's too sensitive. Now, two years later, four years later, but how long will you push it? So maybe हमारे यहाँ पे इसका solution जैसे Americans ने electoral college रखा हुआ हमारे यहाँ पे maybe राज्य सभा में southern states को ज़्यादा representation देना एक solution हो सकता है ना? I think that's a very good point and there are several committees that have looked into it and I think that's a fair point. The counterpoint to that Kushal is that uh, in the राज्य सभा and there is a lot of debate on the राज्य सभा also now the राज्य सभा was meant to be a council of states right? Ten years ago, the uh, uh, the rule uh, in the People of Representation Act was changed, and it allowed um, Rajya Sabha members to be uh, to be elected to the Rajya Sabha even if they were not domiciled in that state. So Manmohan Singh, for example, became a Rajya Sabha MP from Assam. Uh, um, uh, there were other uh, uh, leaders from BJP and others uh, who can be. So basically, it, it meant that any political party could appoint anybody from any state as long as there are numbers in that state and that person doesn't have to be from that state. So there's a deeper debate. Ki, is the Rajya Sabha really as representative of states anymore as it was envisaged? So again, that question will, I think, also have to be addressed then. But you're right. You could Sorry. certainly give more quotas to, to states in the Rajya Sabha. That's one way of doing it. And quantitatively, that, that, that will address this issue. But qualitatively, I think we should address the larger debate as well. The right. So one viewer has asked this question. Why has the BJP not been that effective in 2004 and 2009 under LK Advani? 
as it was under the modi government or the modi leadership so uh, i think there are uh, several answers to that the first answer in uh, the first part of the answer is in the question itself that modi and advani are very different leaders uh, mm-hmm. leadership is crucial to this um, see lk advani was the person who um, rejuvenated the bjp from two seats in 1984 to becoming uh, uh, you know 100 plus seats after ram temple he he ran the rath yatra the somnath to ayodhya rath yatra that catapulted the bjp's rise from nothingness to becoming a key player nationally but after that i think after the demolition of the babri masjid um, and and the narendra narendra modi became an important leader because he worked with lk advani because he he um, uh, he uh, he was a key organizer of that um, first part of the rath yatra from somnath uh, to the borders of gujarat uh, until ayodhya so i think uh, and uh, 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 modi uh, first became to national prominence from there uh, onwards but i think uh, by the time advani takes over the congress oh, sorry the bjp presidency uh, after vajpay he has become a very different leader um, no disrespect to him but advani see there the difference between modi and advani is very simple Ad- bjp became big from nothing to the single largest party because of its ideology uh, but the charge against advani fundamentally was for the faithful or the of the party and i'm just laying out the argument was that you you did all this to become important but fundamentally when push comes to shove you don't stand by the ideology so advani once goes to pakistan he makes the jinnah statement that had a big push back um, in power you make many many compromises in the nda and so on so i think advani had started looking like a much more jaded leader by that time modi was a much younger leader I think I've lost you Nalin. Nalin uh, is not audible right now but guys. But this new BJ can you hear me Kushal? Yeah now I can. In between you had become Sorry. Un- uh, un- 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 so what the signal went what I was saying was Mr Advani represented an older generation of politics and an older BJP which was the Vajpay uh, Advani era that had by the early 2000s that uh, you know had it had outlived its its possibilities of expansion mr modi represented a new bjp and a new kind of politics and a and an advance from that paradigm and and he also uh, so i think that was very key so in fact everything with the new bjp has built uh, under under modi's leadership in 2014 onwards is significantly different from the old, from the old bjp era it builds on those that foundation but it's completely different in the way it runs the party and the kind of growth growth patterns it, it is it is unleashed on the party fair enough okay then um, are we seeing a discourse from now on was that any party toying a center or a little center right or far right approach that is the only way they are going to be defeating bjp in the future so uh, that's a important question kushal my sense is um, again right is a very loaded term in india because yeah uh, you know typically left social right, right as you know yeah. we talk about social this. right yeah, yeah. economic uh, to bjp is yeah. more left than the congress yes. yeah so i think the point is that um i think i don't think that so okay it is possible in india at a state level to be in power or to win an election if you are pro muslim but i don't think it is possible in india to win an election now um um if you are seen to be anti hindu now i'm not saying whether you're anti or pro hindu but if you are seen to be that um because i think the the uh, there is a, a a renewed hinduness um there are shades of that uh, there is the extreme right culturally there is uh, the moderate right there is a the center but the center has moved to the right uh, culturally so if you are seen to be against hindus in general rightly or wrongly it is very difficult for you to win an election 
Mm. And that yeah. goes into deeper issues of cultural pride, um, uh, religiosity, uh, the space of Hinduness in India's culture and so on. I'm not talking about whether this is right or wrong, but I think that's a psychological reality in India today. Mm. Hey, this is the interesting question. Hai. Kisi ne hai. Granted, BJP will dominate in the long run. Where will the opposition head in the interim? <laughs> Um, uh, well, I think a very, uh, I think a robust opposition is very important for our democracy. Uh, I don't think it is in the interest of India if you don't have a robust opposition. Uh, um, the right now, the fact of the matter is you are seeing a vacuum in national politics at the opposition level. Pol- vacuum. Politics always abhors a vacuum. At some point, some creative solutions will get evolved. But fundamentally, the challenge to the BJP. So I, I will tell you one thing. The BJP uh, was much more worried, I think, in my personal opinion, much more worried about the Congress three years ago than it is today. The real challenge for the Congress, uh, for the BJP today, is in the states from regional parties. They are putting up a much more robust defense. Because fundamentally, now you can't. These are real political parties that know how to fight an election. The Congress today has become, and I uh, and we don't know whether it, it will transform after its next president is elected or whoever the next president is going to be, we don't know. Um, the Congress today is fighting elections much more on Twitter and on social media than it is on the ground. And its cadre below it is shifting entirely. So we have a structural problem in our politics right now and a vacuum at a national level. Yeah, but see, at the end of the day, it is not the BJP's problem to see whether India has an opposition of law or not is uh, is quite obvious. Uh, BJP ka kaam in fact, on the contrary, I think BJP makes sure and it makes an extra effort to make sure that Congress remains the fulcrum of Indian politics because the BJP is convinced that they, they benefit with the Congress. So if you notice the BJP communication, it is always centered around the Congress and Rahul Gandhi. The BJP makes sure... Its communication is always about, Dekho Rahul Gandhi kya kar ra. You are absolutely right. Just see in the last two days, the uh, the um, the messaging around Rahul. Um, I think even in UP, when everyone was talking about a Congress revival and Prenka Gandhi was, was all over the place, I think the BJP was very happy with that. Um, oh, yeah. Saying ki, um, because, because um, see, today, um, Rahul Gandhi is one of Modi's biggest assets politically, and I'm making a, saying it very bluntly. Um, the um, if you see the BJP's communication pattern, and you're right, Kushal, when we track the in the on our Narad index that we built for the new BJP book, um, when we track communication patterns, we found that from 2016 17 onwards, the BJP speaks much more about the Congress than it speaks about itself. So, essentially, what the BJP is telling it's voters also is that hum jo bhi hai, hum Congress nahi hai. Uh, 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 so there is this sense there is because at one level it is what you stand for at another level it is what you don't stand for just as the Congress is saying has very little to offer today as an idea and I, I we don't know whether a better idea will evolve or not politically but currently it is stands for being being essentially the anti BJP force or the anti Modi force but it's not clear beyond that what it stands for beyond a loose defense of secularism and so on. Um, but BJP is very clear what it stands for. That it stands for Hindu nationalism. It stands for a certain model of development. It stands for a welfare state in a particular manner. Uh, it stands for social engineering and so on. It is led by Modi. And it is not the Congress. Which is why the lampooning of Rahul Gandhi is very important in the BJP's project, projection. Hmm. And Rahul I Gandhi mean, is doing his best to help, the, to help them right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but that's that's exactly what's happening. Look, what is happening with the Congress was so emblematic in terms of idea in the recent debate between my dear friend Harsh Madhusudan Gupta and some a Congressy that I respect, Shashi Tharoor. Mm. That debate was emblematic what was problematic with the Congress. It's just old ideas which just don't connect with the people anymore and the Congress refuses to change and the problem with the Congress is if it changes, it becomes BJP, then why would you want to be BJP? And uh, I don't know. I mean, I think AAP was so smart. If people remember AAP's trajectory, it went far left first. Uh, who who has forgotten Arvind Kejriwal denying the Batla House encounter? Arvind did everything. And then Arvind realized, oh, Baba, this is problematic. Let's strategy change. And Congress followed Arvind. 
एंड कांग्रेस रिमेन देयर एंड अरविंद काइंड ऑफ कैप्टन इन द रूम लॉक कर दिया चाबी फेंक दी गटर में और वापस आ गया अरविंद एंड यू नो ही आउटडेट द कांग्रेस सो क्रेडिट टू अरविंद ओके आई विल टेक द नेक्स्ट फ्यू क्वेश्चंस अगेन बिकॉज़ वी आर ऑन द ओपोजिशन सो आई विल टेक दिस फर्स्ट एंड देन आई विल टेक अनदर वन आज बिफोर दैट आफ्टर इट why has the opposition failed election after election at the center to take down the government is modi steflon quoting perennial <laughs> um so i think the bjp has had reverses at the state level uh, it has lost bengal for example it has lost other states in the past on the state level you've had bjp from 2014 to now has won more elections than it has lost overall it has done better in in these elections than it did before no question about that but it has lost some elections national level it's gone gone, gone from state to strength um a lot of that has got to do with um, the way the bjp does its politics with its leadership um um the way it is built a constituency far beyond its core constituency which is of hindutva uh, which is around the welfare state around women voters which is very important um in newer areas uh, i think you know it's very easy to um the word teflon coating for modi and his popularity i think it's um, it's um, it's true because and all the surveys show us that it, the only time modi's popularity went down on a if you see, track it on a pattern uh, the india today surveys if you look at uh, was around the corona virus period uh, and it went and it really suffered in that time and then it's gone up again it's now back to pre almost back somewhere back to pre corona uh, levels now just about there um i think this is because there is a constant effort to to keep uh, uh, at at politics it's not an automatic thing that happens on its own i think we should we have to accept that politics today is a 24/7 business and you have to understand what you're doing um i think people in this country are smart enough one of the big critiques with the opposition makes of, of prime minister modi and of the uh, and of the bjp has been ki you are doing gimmickry you are doing advertising you are doing uh, 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 you know you are essentially communicating and talking things but aap actually nahi kar rahe ho you know i think people in this country are smart enough to see beyond that uh, if they are voting for modi or a bjp i think the opposition must ask itself you can't fool people beyond a certain point of time the bjp may have chinks in its armor the bjp even criticize for various things but fundamentally the people of this country at so far for the 7 8 years have been seeing the bjp as a better alternative than the than the other and i think it's important to introspect and understand for those who don't like the bjp to understand why that is happening and it's not happening just because the, all this country is voting for hindutva it's not yeah true so this question is uh, slightly lamba so first of all the questioner asked them um, starts by saying congratulations nalin on keeping such a thorough database analysis of indian politics one question how is in courts loyalty score distributed in the newly acquired support for by the bjp how does it vary nationally and regionally hmm uh okay so i think that's a uh, firstly thank you very much for those um, uh, for those comments uh, very generous comments uh, i have some numbers of the bjp membership um, i'm not sure if we can measure loyalty as such but um, let me first give you the numbers and then some analysis around that Um, sure. If the if you look at the BJP's membership growth, the BJP basically grew in its cadre. Uh, see, there are two ways we can look at the numbers. You can look at the vote share numbers and seat share numbers, so that gives you one level of analysis. And then you can look at the cadre numbers and draw a juxtaposition between them. And the only way you can analyze it is through post poll surveys to see what are the caste groups that have come. So the the numbers that show us uh, uh, the firstly has the BJP grown across the country? Yes, the election state data shows that. Um, second has it grown by increasing its geographies of influence yes because from being an urban uh, upper caste party brahmin banya party pre 2014 it's become the party of the rural in the heartland uh, uh, largely growing in rural areas and semi rural areas um, in the 11 hindi speaking states while keeping its urban dominance so it's become a very different party in uh, it's become the default party of the village in north india now uh, the data also shows us that it brought in new constituencies women in particular women never voted for bjp in large numbers they always voted more for congress in 2019 which is the first election in indian history where women turnout was slightly slightly higher than the male turnout typically the male turnout has been much higher than women turnout in that election uh, in every major state 
more women voted for BJP than they voted for Congress. So the women vote is significant increase for the BJP. That's one. Second is, you know, the newer OBC, uh, OBCs, largely the non-Yadav OBCs and non-Dalit uh, uh, um, SCs. And now increasingly tribal votes. You look at OBC seats, look at uh, uh, SC dominated seats, look at tribal seats. You see massive advances by BJP in, uh, in the post-2014 period, in election after election. Then you look at um, the, uh, the the cadre membership. So the uh, of these one uh, uh, seventy four million roughly of the registered BJP members, the BJP itself reports that about eighteen million came from UP Uttarakhand, eleven million from Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, eleven million, Maharashtra, Goa, another twenty point four million, uh, uh, Bihar, Jharkhand, around nine million. Rajasthan 7 million, West Bengal 4 million, Delhi is about 4 million and then Andhra, uh, Tamil Nadu, Odisha, they are all in the 3 to 4 million kind of range. Um, uh, states like uh, Haryana, Assam are around the 2.5 million kind of range, even, even Punjab where the BJP doesn't do very well electorally. Now the analysis of this is, I have spoken to a number of BJP leaders on this and RSS leaders. One of the, like, uh, like a senior RS, RSS leader told me, yeah, they go, BJP ka bhi growth ho raha hai aur RSS ka bhi growth ho raha hai. RSS cadre is also expanding and RSS was facing a serious crisis of membership before Modi came to power. But in the last eight years, you're seeing a massive spurt in RSS membership too. So one of the big concerns he had, one of the, this was one of the prant heads of the RSS in a, one of the big states. He told me, he said, look, my biggest concern is when new members come that we are concerned whether they are genuinely joining us because they believe in us or they're joining us to be closer to power i.e. that when we lose power, these guys will leave and they are, they are trans transient migratory birds. So I am so, uh, and, and, and then it's your judgment as a leader that the people who are defecting to your side, how genuine are they? Now, if, if, this is at the very lower cadre level. You look at the higher level, the BJP is built today in its expansion in new areas from people who were in other parties. Himanta Biswa Sarma built the BJP in Northeast, fulcrum of that, Chief Minister of Assam. Jyotiradar Sindhya has, has come over with his flock in Madhya Pradesh. Um, one third of the ministers in the Shivraj Singh uh, Chauhan government today are from the Jyotiradar Jyotira Sindhya flock who were erstwhile Congress, um, uh, which meant that a lot of RSS uh, background ministers had to, had to be taken out of that government to accommodate these ones. Uh, you see RPN Singh, Jitain Prasad, who's now a minister in, uh, in UP. That's at the apex, you know, at the higher elite levels of politics. But I think even if you take aside the question of loyalty is the question you asked. Uh, I think it is a fair assumption to make that uh, some proportion of these leaders who have defected or carders have come because that's the this is the place to be uh, if you want to grow politically. And tomorrow, if they find better pastures, they, they may leave. They may not believe in the ideology in, in ways that uh, the older carder believes. And that's also a tension between the older carder and the newer people. The older carder says, look, we were with the party when it had nothing. You built the party on our shoulders. Now you've got the outsiders coming in. But that's part of a natural push and balance. Whenever you have expired, if you give a company analogy, you need a certain talent set to build a startup uh, and to grow to a certain scale. When you want to scale up and diversify, you need other kinds of talent sets. So that's a natural push and pull you'll have in any party when it grows at this scale. Yeah, I think one of the BJP success stories has been... You know, in that sense, currently in Indian politics, BJP is like the United States of America where it attracts the best talent from everywhere and uses its platform to use their skills to develop new, new things. So uh, you can't blame the BJP for getting the best talents from everywhere. It's, it's, it's as simple as that in politics. The, one more question has been asked by a viewer. What do you make of the minority vote bank eventually shifting to the BJP then? Do you think that 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 eventually, if if the BJP is going to be the dominant force till 2047, and it's going to be the fulcrum of Indian politics where everything is going to be based around the BJP, then don't you think the natural uh, swift movement of eventually certain... Okay, I get it. Some minorities will never turn around to BJP because it's a trust issue, and I completely understand it. But there will be a lot of people who eventually will start moving to the BJP as they will see, okay, look, this is uh, this is kind of uh, the option and let us start considering them. Do you see that as a possibility? Because that will make BJP an even stronger base. I think that's a, uh, that's a very important question, Kushal. 
um, if if yeah, you know i if you uh, is my screen still being shared kushal yeah yeah, yeah. graphic okay. to show on this um, sure. so on the minority question um there's a piece i wrote for the times of india recently uh, on um the bjp's growth in muslim significant seats uh, by that i mean seats which have more than 30% muslim voters um mm-hmm. and you will see that uh, over the last 10 years the bjp has grown in muslim significant seats um winning much more than it's losing in seats uh, um uh, and much more than congress now that does not mean that that muslims voted for the bjp in these states in these seats what it means is uh, um that these seats saw polarization and uh, uh the hindu candidate ended up winning uh, uh in in this uh, uh, winning in, in because of polarization so polarization has helped the bjp in muslim significant seats where the bjp um uh, did well in up for example if you just see this number Uh, in seats where the bjp had over uh, where bjp won over 40% vote it it was 13 seats in in up uh, in uh, in seats uh, and 11 in in 2019 and look at the congress number it was zero so i think um, poll, uh, so that's one now to come to the question will minorities vote for bjp or not so um, all the data shows us that in 2022 for example in the up election if that's an example um the muslim vote was against the bjp largely uh it was a muslim yadav vote which went with samajwadi party uh which voted against uh, 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 to vote out the bjp candidates now uh, however about 6% of muslims in 2022 up elections voted for bjp i was surprised when i saw that number i thought it would be lower so uh, the bjp has been Uh, working assiduously to change the paradigm on this politically uh, the first step on this was uh, the um, the the triple talaq law which was brought in by this government uh, in the by the previ- uh, in its previous avatar before 2019 and the idea was to get some segment of muslim women uh, on on the triple talaq question um some of this 6% vote that comes to from muslim voters in up to bjp uh, comes from those kind of initiatives um some of it and now you have you are seeing an outreach with to pasmanda muslims so they are like basically three or four kinds of categorizations which muslim scholars put around around the sociology of uh, uh, um of uh, indian muslims so there are the ashrafs uh, uh, and and the pasmanda muslims are largely lower caste um um understood to be been many, many people who converted from hinduism to islam and the ashrafs essentially and, and then there is another division of those who came in uh, from more elite classes in in earlier uh, uh, you know when 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 muslim migrations happened to india in in centuries past so i think the 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 because the development data shows us very clearly that the if the welfare schemes of the bjp using direct benefit transfers the mobile phone and aadhar are a key fulcrum of growth in rural india uh, the proportion of muslims getting that is exactly on par there is no difference in that and those them getting it the, the problem i think is on muslim representation politically the bjp didn't give seats uh, uh, tickets to muslims in up in neither in lok sabha or in vidhan sabha it used to give one or two seats earlier this time it didn't give in 14 19 and so it got away from the tokenism earlier also it was doing tokenism this time is not doing tokenism but in terms of the of this government schemes uh, uh, and i have done looked at this both qual- quantitatively at the macro level and also doing dipstick qualitative surveys in muslim dominated areas there is no distinction in 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 muslims or others getting those benefit schemes agar leakage hai to sabke liye barabar hai aur mil raha hai to sabko barabar mil raha hai the problem is in the level of discourse uh, in uh, in issues around hate speech by extreme right wing factions and on political representation so for example you have a minister muslim minister in the up government you had a muslim minister in the in the modi government who's uh, muqtar abbas nakvi who's term is not been renewed now um so that is an issue to be to be t- talked about um, the bjp will if you ask the bjp they'll say hamara hamara answer is aap sabka saath sabka vikas and it's a question of we will give seats to people who can win seats for us right that that's the that, that's the political answer they will give you but now with the outreach to pasmanda muslims which the prime minister has personally fronted uh, that 
we'll see how that goes but that has many possibilities because what you are saying is that the discourse uh, uh, of bjp with minorities from this side uh, is 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 run by elites who uh, who may or may not necessarily be in touch with the ground reality and therefore if you create a uh, a newer kind of narrative with people who are benefiting from government schemes with pasmanda muslims who may not have leadership positions in the community but are numerically much more and maybe benefiting from government schemes you could see a schism now there's a lot of politics to happen on this a lot of things this is an evolving thing but this is an interesting move by the bjp i think uh, uh, as an outreach to to pasmanda muslims all right you know a lot has been said about the economics and about how the economy this or economy is that um you know so bjp success as far as i am concerned like uh maybe i'll put it this so what was uh, in your thing when you were studying the bjp success what was the most counterintuitive thing that you found that is one question and do you think the bjp success is actually getting the basics right this is the second one okay so the thing that surprised me most is the women factor uh the fact that if you look at um, major anti bjp movements in the last 3 or 4 years look at caa look at nrc when the government brought in that it was led a lot by women activists in city after city after city um uh, the bjp was seen as a party of patriarchy uh, um um so when i saw the data it showed surprised me on multiple levels firstly the fact that the bjp's growth has been driven largely by a growth to a large extent by a growth of women voters who have shifted from congress to B, to to bjp uh, and when i started looking at so the question i was asking myself is okay this data is irrefutable now the question is did this happen on its own uh, organically or was the bjp aggressively strategically trying to do this and did it do specific things that led to this result the result we know what happened but why did it happen when i started looking at that the answers were very clear in terms of political representation uh, the bjp did specific things if you look at the prime minister modi's political communication you will see among the top 5 things he speaks about in his speeches women are part of those are among the top 5 much more than the core issues of the bjp like ram temple 370 hindutva um, all of those things um, so that was one but optics is just one thing yeah people don't buy just talking the talk people want to see you walk the talk so if you look at the bjp's political representation structures uh, look at seats given to lok sabha candidates and vidhan sabha candidates and we looked at up in particular the bjp gave more tickets to women than any party in india in uh, uh, as a percentage in 2019 the bjp today has the largest women contingent in parliament it is significantly many times larger than the next party's women contingent which is of the trinamool congress um this if you look at the at modi's uh, council of ministers it has more women representation than any government in indian history and we looked at we tracked all governments using government data um so modi's represent, uh, representation of uh, women in his uh, in his ministerial cabinet is around 12.5% which is more than the 11% under manmohan singh upa 1 and 2 and around the 9 10% mark of of the vajpayee government that preceded him um this is obviously still lower than the share of women in the population but it's significantly more than what has ever been before you look at the bjp's party structures the bjp today has got more women in leadership positions at its organized central leadership level than any other party in india as a percentage and here i am counting the congress i am counting uh, uh the left which are seen as the more progressive party cpi cpm trinamool all of these parties and the congress numbers by the way include sonia gandhi and priyanka gandhi so the bjp did major shifts uh, to get women into its fold uh, much more than other parties and that has all led to this i'll give you an example kushal um look at republic day parades women uh, in in the armed forces is not a bjp invention women have been in the armed forces for a while uh, and in the paramilitary forces but look at republic day parades since 2014 you see the amount of women power in uniform that is a political move that is uh, that is not generally military bureaucracies are much more resistant to change the showcasing of women part this year's republic day the rafale uh, uh, planes were showcased 
the showcase of the rafale was the woman fighter pilot who was who, who, in the rafale squadron um whenever prime minister modi goes to the border areas to uh, and gets photographed with soldiers on the border you will always see one or two or three women soldiers in the in the in the photograph there is a very uh, if you see the republic day contingents how many women commanders were there in the military parades um they were always there in the army but to showcase women as a strategic strategically is 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 very much part of the strategic shift of the bjp politically made in this government politically made um and this went in tandem with increase of share in political um, representation structures at the party level at the government level um and at the electoral level this was one big change and find the second thing that really surprised me kushal is the deep nature of the caste shift by the bjp the bjp which was a brahmin baniya party um uh, uh its entire growth from 14 to 19 of the new bjp was driven by getting new caste groups that were traditionally not with the bjp in this number obcs non jadav obcs dalits non jadav dalits to a lesser extent and then scheduled tribes um this flies completely counter and we talked about this before kushal to the academic debate around the bjp so christoph jafferlaw uh, from this from cnspo and ashoka university for example uh, and the ashoka center argued that modi's defense uh, modi's rise in 14 and 19 were were what they called because of the revenge of the upper caste quote and quote uh, that it was driven by upper caste mp uh, upper caste driving this bhai upper caste to bjp ke sath raha बट इतने सारे जो दूसरे कास्ट थे वो आए दैट इज वाई बीजेपी इज एक्सपेंडेड एंड द नंबर शो दैट एब्सोल्युटली क्रिस्टल क्लियर टुडे द नंबर ऑफ मिनिस्टर ओबीसी एंड एससी मिनिस्टर्स एंड एमपीज इफ यू लुक एट एमपीज 65 टू 66% ऑफ द बीजेपीज एमपीज टुडे इन पार्लियामेंट आर आइदर ओबीसी एससी और एसटी एंड दैट्स मेनी ऑफ दीस आर नॉट इलेक्टेड फ्रॉम रिजर्व सीट्स एससीज फ्रॉम नॉट दे आर मोर देन फ्रॉम रिजर्व सीट्स for as per see for see as the reserve if you look at same thing in up in the vidhan sabha same thing in the council of ministers of central government and of um, uh, of the up government so you are seeing a massive social expansion of the bjp to the point where at every level you look at it shows that bjp in north india today is the most socially representative party by caste barring muslims yeah and just to add to bjp is the only political party officially that follows reservations for women in posts 33% officially as a party they have reservations for women yes and this yeah. this happens. nobody else does this kushal uh, this is one of the thing that surprised me it's one thing to make a statement ki hum karenge nahi karenge no nee, actually do it the bjp is organized at 21 member karyakarinis at the booth level उसके ऊपर एक लेवल है फिर डिस्ट्रिक्ट लेवल फिर स्टेट लेवल फिर प्रांत लेवल नेशनल लेवल एट ईच लेवल सो एट द बूथ लेवल फॉर एग्जांपल इन यूपी फॉर एग्जांपल वी गो लाइक द मथुरा अब मथुरा में जाएंगे मथुरा में 2100 बूथ है 2100 बूथ की के 21 2100 डिस्ट्रिक्ट बूथ लेवल प्रेसिडेंट है हर एक प्रेसिडेंट की 21 21 मेंबर की कार्यकारिणी है उस कार्यकारिणी के अंदर पांच सीटें और विमेन के लिए रिजर्वड हैं और छह या सात सीटें एससी एसटी ओबीसी और एससी के लिए रिजर्वड हैं so in the beginning when they tried to do this obviously they could uh, so many of the women who came in were sisters wives mothers of existing bjp karyakarta but for every Amishai. five who came in like that one or two were from a family Amishai. that never voted for bjp wo 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 tha jaise wo reservation for women at the nagar sevak level municipal level jo aaya 50% ka पहले आर्ग्यूमेंट यही दी जाती थी कि नहीं 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 होगा नहीं होगा बट ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम जब वो रिजर्वेशन का सिस्टम इवेंचुअली आया फ्रेश वुमेन स्टार्टेड स्टैंडिंग फॉर पंचायत इलेक्शंस एंड मेनी अदर थिंग्स और काफी लोगों को एंट्री मिलती है इनिशियली यस एक और दो इसमें टाइम लगता है मगर बाद में नेचुरल फ्लो से लोग आना शुरू हो जाते हैं इवन ऑन द कास्ट इशू सी ऑल दिस यू नो ब्राह्मण बनिया पार्टी कार्ड दे डोंट व्हाट दे डोंट अंडरस्टैंड इज बिकॉज दे आर कंप्लीटली डिसकनेक्टेड फ्रॉम द कार्डर वर्क ऑफ बीजेपी मैं तो कभी छुपाया भी नहीं है मैं तो ओपन बीजेपी वोटर हूँ मैं तो कैंपेन भी कर चुका हूँ मैंने तो कभी छुपाया नहीं है ये मैं तो कभी छुपाता भी नहीं हूँ इसके लिए तो इफ यू रिमेम्बर जब मैंने तुम्हारी बुक पढ़ी थी मैंने बोला हाँ इस बंदे ने एक्चुअली बीजेपी को पढ़ा है और समझा है क्योंकि मैंने खुद ये मतलब मैं कोई मेंबर नहीं हूँ बीजेपी का मैं काम करता हूँ मुझे लगता है वो पार्टी बेटर है इस समय कल को नहीं लगा तो मैं उनके अगेंस्ट भी काम करूंगा मगर पॉइंट है आई यूज टू सी वॉट दे डिड इन द ऑफिस द कास्ट मेट्रिक्स दे अंडरस्टैंड द कास्ट मेट्रिक्स बेटर देन मोस्ट पीपल एंड Also at a cultural level, people don't understand Hindutva. 
they hmm. don't understand what savarkar said they don't understand hmm. what rss works for they don't understand how slowly actually hindutva is your biggest anti caste movement of india that is what hmm. the anti caste movement of india is and see what happens is these academics they live in their ivory towers they keep thinking and you know have that ek natural image hai abhi kuch nahi kar sakte one last question before i let you go you know a lot of things have been said about the economics and how much of a factor does you know there is this famous uh, line mentioned by many famous people that you know the courts in india at least cause 1% of uh, uh, you know cost us 1% in terms of economic growth now how much mm-hmm. of a problem do you think the courts and a and this is the last question a, a activist court becomes a problem for the bjp in its future let's say bjp brings in some economic reforms and the courts again interfere and stuff like that so i think um... look i think uh, the long gestation period for uh, economic for for court judgments is a endemic problem part of our structure which goes far beyond bjp or this government um, i think several chief justices serving chief justices of india have spoken about that uh, one of the big issues um, i will i've been speaking to some diplomats in the last couple of weeks in particular on this question and one of the big concerns is that um, um it's not so much what happens later it is about the propensity of the courts to come into areas around policy and and on retrospective issues in particular which scares off investors so for example if you remember the vodafone case in the previous uh, upa government uh, uh, and this was uh, there was a legislation around it then there was supreme court judgment so if somebody is say given an example if somebody puts 100 million today and there's a legal dispute invest in into india there is a legal dispute and it takes you 10 15 years there are currently litigation going on for 15 years kisi company ke 100 million dollar phas jaye to wo 10 bar sochega yaar main yahan pe kyun invest karu main why don't i go to some other country where it is much faster and simpler uh, um, one way or the other you resolve it and also if you can in change the rules of the game in with retrospective effect i think what investors need and any business needs a stable playing field you need to know you can have whatever rules you want but you need to know that there is stability to those rules that once you enter the game suddenly the goal post will not be shifted after you entered the game and that's a larger problem for policy making in india not just with the courts but in general so um as the fulcrum of the global economy is shifting i think everybody is clear that um, a lot of foreign investors are looking at india in a very significant way with 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 the supply chain shifting out of china post covid there's been a major shift but will a lot of that investment come to india or will it go to other countries where these things are easier to handle that's a question and i think that's a challenge i think the government is addressing that to a significant extent but it's an ongoing issue and it's not an easy problem to solve mhm fair enough all right nalin before we wrap it up uh, so i know the new edition of uh, the new bjp has come so so kya hai abhi so what uh, kya changes laye basically nayi nayi so, version mein so here is the new edition kushal uh, uh, the uh, the changes basically ye hain firstly it is slightly updated um, um, we didn't write the book as a quickie but meant as a long term piece like i was saying so uh, since the book came out uh, you've had elections in up um you had uh, the you know in five states election so it's been updated slightly with some of that it fundamentally doesn't change the argument the argument is the same it's just updated with some facts and figures um so it's an updated version uh, very significantly and very importantly it's a thinner version um because one of the critiques i had uh, and a lot of people made uh, it went on social it became a bit viral as well was itni moti kitab hai ki bhai kaise utha ke padhe itni moti kitab bahut bhari hai In, in fact my publisher kartika and i often joke kiya yeah, this can be a murder weapon kisi ke sar pe maro 1.5 kilo ki kitab to you know somebody can collapse so what we try to do was we use a different kind of paper and uh, we reduce for, uh, uh, the production wise we use certain very good uh, interesting and robust uh, techniques so the 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 book is lighter and it is thinner with with and it is so it is and it is more updated and there is no dilution of the content so we try to make it easier to hold and read um, without dumbing it down in any way fair enough uh, uh guys uh, so before we wrap today's session up first of all nalin thanks a lot for coming uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, 
you know when it comes to political predictions aajkal you know it's a, you're a brave man making predictions like this is all i can say kyunki social media ki age mein bhayankar trolling hoti hai i am just looking at thanks kushal i am um, predictions is, is i am just looking at long term trends and the direction of change that's what we are talking about we're not i know we're not saying agle chunav mein ye hoga ya usme ye hoga we're talking about long term trends and direction of our polity yeah not only that the way the society is shifting and and the and to be very honest i, I completely back you in this uh, because the sooner people realize this the better off they will be and i think we might get even a better opposition in this country the problem with the opposition is in this country is they are themselves in denial if when they are in denial the country suffers but nalin thanks for coming and guys i will insist uh, nalin's book is probably one of the finest you can read in terms of political analysis not i say this i've read the book i've obviously spoken about the book previously on the podcast too not only that what is very important it's a it's a open minded insight into the bjp and how they worked it is not it's not a book written to find flaws i got you see when you start looking at trends with a gotcha mindset you'll never get the truth what i liked about nalin was and and, uh, and nalin might not remember this hum log whatsapp pe baat kar rahe the and i was reading the book i was like yaar ye to maine idhar experience kiya tha yaar ye to maine idhar experience kiya yes. tha in my ground work i, I, I kept very on, well yeah i would you go on a very and, deep reading of it kushal yeah so and and you know this book clearly shows where the so called experts uh, messed up so buy this book if you have not bought it the new edition uh, as nalin said is lighter so i insist you guys buy it you will actually understand how the bjp works you may not like them you may like them you may not vote for them you may vote for them but the least you can do is study them with honesty how they do it why they do it so in the description of the podcast whether you're listening to this on spotify itunes google podcast wherever or you're watching this on youtube the link to nalin's book is there click the link buy it leave a nice review over there and as far as i'm concerned you know the drill please subscribe to the charvak podcast youtube channel or you can you know go and write reviews on itunes and spotify and if you're a listener over there you can also support uh, the podcast by becoming a member on youtube or on patreon or by buying the merch or your donations to upi i will see you guys next time until then namaste take care bye bye